Again, we join the American family Robinson. In our last program, Editor Luke and Miss Timmons were plotting to get her property away from Windy Bill. Miss Timmons was found by young Bob Robinson towing the country in Windy's house car, which proved to be a bad bargain. Miss Timmons has vowed revenge on Windy. Apparently, she's gotten over her infatuation for that gentleman when she discovered he had tricked her. He intends to sell her property to Mr. Jason for the new factory site and pocket the profits. Today, however, we leave her and Editor Luke to complete their plans and pay a visit to Devil's Gulch and our honeymooners, Betty and Dick Collins. We find Mr. Webb, the owner of the Dude Ranch, and a neighbor of his, just finishing a meal, which Dick has prepared. You remember that Dick offered to take the place of Chuck Peters, the ranch house cook, if Chuck would substitute for him as Betty's riding escort. Mr. Webb is speaking. Well, I must say your flapjacks ain't quite like the ones Mother used to make, Mr. Collins, but they're adequate, I reckon. I knew I was going to leave something out. Just to make sure, I put in everything I could find in the kitchen. <laughs> but I guess you haven't got the missing ingredient in stock, whatever it is. Well, it ain't so much what's missing. It... Glory be. Say, there was some buckshot out there. You didn't put that in, did you? Of course not. You don't taste any buckshot, do you? Well, it'll be a little hard to tell. I, I thought I tasted some lead pipe in there for a minute, and it did seem kind of heavy-like. Oh, but never mind. That makes him stick by your ribs all the better. Hey, cousin? Oh, don't take Webb serious, Mr. Collins. All he means is your conversation is better than your cooking. Yes, I gathered that. Well, if you'd rather have Chuck Peters do your cooking, all I can say is go ahead. Chuck's no, Mr. Collins. I'd rather have you any day. Chuck, he can't cook, and he ain't got good sense either. You at least got good sense. Well, thanks very much. That's something. Sure you got good sense, Mr. Collins. Webb was telling me is how you explained to him about taxes and government spending. How people are hollering for more money to spend. And then hollering about heavy taxes at the same time. <laughs> like, uh, like robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, somehow people just don't seem to see no relation between the two. Well, I'm not exactly the first person to bring that out. But if I help you fellows see it, maybe I have been of some use. You know, there are a lot of folks who don't seem to realize that all this money has to be taken out of the people's pockets by the government. Sure, but uh, if you could only think up some way of curing the trouble. Oh, easy. If people hollered for less government spending, they wouldn't have to holler about taxes because that would take care of itself. Taxes hit the thrifty job holder the hardest. Spending billions of dollars helps people who are unemployed, but it isn't going to help very much if it's spent so lavishly that it's going to bankrupt the people who already have jobs and the government. Well, still it does seem pretty necessary to give people some security. And if they know the government will kick in during a pinch... You're right. People must be made to feel secure. But why do they feel insecure? Because food prices, along with taxes, have been raised. And that has removed the margin of safety from the average pay envelope. The average American worker has always been used to having enough money to lay aside a bit against a rainy day. When he can no longer do that, he feels insecure. Higher prices and taxes certainly won't help him much. Doggone if it ain't a vicious circle. Spend money to make people feel secure. But if you do spend it, they'll feel less secure all the time. That sounds bad. It would be bad if you hadn't overlooked the most obvious answer to the whole problem. There is one channel of employment which won't cost the present job holders any money in taxes and raised prices, and that's private industry. And that's where we've got to start if we're going to get anywhere at all with recovery. Yeah, but uh, where is industry going to get the money for all these new jobs? As soon as people get the idea that recovery comes first, before all these badly timed attempts at reform of the whole business and social structure, people will invest freely in industry. And that will solve the job security question, and then it will be time enough to think of any needed reforms. Boy, you sure got all the answers. You're wasting your time cooking flapjacks. Now, what you ought to do Hello, is to go... Hello, old stick in the mud. Hello, Betty. Is the economic forum still in session? Uh, now, Miss Collins, you oughtn't to come in here interrupting us like that. Well, I like that. Is he my husband or yours? Betty, nobody would know I was your husband. You're never around where I am. And why? Because you never go anywhere or do anything except hang around this kitchen. Cooking, of all things, and talking. Well, it's all right for a young man to talk and think sensibly about national affairs. It's important. Most of these young dudes we get out here talk a lot of half-baked socialism. More important than his wife, I suppose. <laughs> Don't you ever think of having any fun, Dick? 
What'd you come out here for, anyway? Because you made me come out here, that's why. Uh, Webb, uh, you was going to show me that new stock you bought. I reckon this would be a good time to go do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> well, uh, see you later, Mr. Collins. Uh, don't take it too hard, and... But don't give in. Oh, that man, pitying you. Taking sides with you and glaring at me as if I were a lame-brained little fluff. Oh, Mr. Webb's all right when you get to know him. I didn't come out here to get to know Mr. Webb. I came out here on my honeymoon. And a fine honeymoon it is. Oh, we've been over this before, dear. You see, I don't like horses. Oh, nonsense. You won't even try them, Dick. All you have to do is to get used to riding, and then you'll love it. Look at me. I'm having a glorious time. Why, just this morning, I learned how to throw a lariat. Chuck and I are... Oh, Chuck, is it? So it's come to that. Well, of course. You can't force me into the exclusive company of a person every day and not have me get to know him by his first name, I hope. Listen, I don't like that guy. It's all right. He doesn't like you either. Oh, he doesn't. Well, why not? Well, he says you're scared to... Scared of what? Not of him, I hope. Or does he actually think he's got me bluffed with that act he puts on? Oh, no. Scared of horses. <laughs> we thought of borrowing a rocking horse from one of the neighbor's kids and putting it on the porch with your name on it. But I, I, I thought you might not see the joke. Is that so? Chuck's terribly funny sometimes. <laughs> He's a good mimic, too, you know. Y you ought to see the way he imitates you. Yes, I'd like to, just once. Well, I'll show you. He sort of paces up and down the room like this with his hands behind his back, and he says, uh, <clears throat> What this country needs is less horse flesh and more and more sofa pillows. Then people would realize... Why, that four flusher. I'm going out there and poke his face in. Hey, I'll fix him up so he'll never face another camera. But, Dick, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. You can't do that. I, I didn't mean to start anything. Well, I mean to finish something. Hey, you, Peters, Dick, come here. Wait a minute. Morning, Professor. What's the matter? Did the audience walk out on you? Get down off that horse. Oh, he's all right. He won't bite you. Why is as gentle as a lamb? Never mind the horse. Get off. Oh, don't mind the horse. Not at all. You see, I'm different. Now, you take some people, the minute they see one, why, they go pale. If you don't come down, I'll come up there after you. Well, well, spoken like a little man. He isn't scared of the big bad horsey after all. Scared, <laughs> huh? I'll show you whether I'm scared. Bring out one of your animals and I'll ride them. And when I get through, I'll push your teeth in. Oh, Dickie, will you ride with us? Let's go down to the corral right now. Well, maybe I better hit him first. No, no, Dick, wait till after I ride, and I'll help you hit him. Uh, you'll <laughs> have a long wait if you wait till after he rides. Is that so? Bring on your horse, that's all. I'll show you. You better bring up Daisy, Chuck. She's nice and gentle, and bring Dancer for me. No, you won't bring Daisy either. If I'm going to ride a horse, I'm going to ride a good one. There isn't a nag on this ranch that I'm afraid of. Oh, I suppose you think you can ride Blue Lightning. You bet I can. Bring him on. Oh, no, Dick. Not Blue Lightning. <laughs> oh, this is going to be good. Oh, Dick, you can't do this. Blue Lightning is absolutely wild. You'll never be able to... Oh, yes, I can. And I'll show you up, too. You think you've married a sissy, eh? Oh, but, dear, you don't have to break your neck to prove you're not a sissy. Oh, Mr. Now, Webb, never mind but... calling him. I've made up my mind. Yeah, what's the truth? Oh, dear, Chuck was kidding Dick about being afraid of horses, and now Dick's got mad and he's going to ride blue lightning. There, I knew it. Just like a woman to go deviling a man till he goes does, does something crazy. Oh, you... Uh, Mr. Collins, I wouldn't ride that Mustang myself. You're not going to go committing suicide on account of your wife, are you? I have made up my mind. Well, all I got to say is, it sure has been nice knowing you, Mr. Oh, Collins. Huh? I'll remember everything you said, and I'd like to shake hands before I set off to town for the doctor. Oh. Well, now, I don't know, but what I'd better get the undertaker to come out, too. <laughs> It'll save a trip. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. Uh, uh, goodbye? Oh, yeah, goodbye. Well, here he is. Hey, cowboy, you mount from the left side. Oh, oh, I know oh, which Dick. side. Whoa, keep still, you beast. Oh, Dick, please. Now, now, let me hold him for you. Get away. I don't need your help. Stand still, you. There. <laughs> Come on, Betty. You'd better get aboard that other animal. This one wants to go places. You better hold him. Once he takes out on you, you're a goner. You'll keep your advice to yourself. You ready, Betty? Let's go. Are you all right, Dick? Uh, well, uh, of course. Uh, this is a cinch. Uh, he, he's as gentle as a lamb. <laughs> you know, they say horses can always sense when you're afraid of them. It makes them mad. Oh, by the way, Blue Lightning's ears are back. You better watch him. Let's go back. You've already shown you can ride him, Dick. 
Not much of a ride. Why, I'm I'm just beginning to enjoy it. We'll ride out to the canyon and back. Swear. How about a little race? Get going, Pete. Come on. No, Dick, wait for me. What's the matter? Well, your your horse is making Dan so nervous. You, you you better stick with me. Well, of course, if you're afraid. But I hate to let that guy. Look. Look, Pete stopped. Something's the matter. Yeah, and Peters fell off. <laughs> oh, boy, am I glad I came. Come on. Let's see what happens. Come on. Right. <laughs> Here, stay back. Rattlesnake. Paint shy and buck me off. Where is it? Oh, it slid off into the bushes. Wait, I want to get a shot at it. No, no, come on. Let's go back. Hey, from what I've seen of your shooting, you better try a club. There he is. <laughs> Betty! Her horse is running away with her. Oh, get after her while I catch paint. It's all right, Betty. Hang on. Come on, you beast. Get going. I, I can't. Can you jump off? No! Hey, we'll have to go around the canyon and hit her off. She's making for the cliff. Not me. I'm going after her. Why, you'll break your neck. I'll be right with you, Betty! <laughs> Betty! 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 Here. Here I am, Dick. Where? I, I can't see you. Up here. In the tree. Uh, good heavens. How did you get up there? Well, I... I, I grabbed it as it went by. Get me down. Oh, boy. Wait a minute. There. I've got your feet. Now drop. Oh, oh Dick, I, I was so frightened. Of course you were, you poor kid. I'll never get on another horse as long as I live. Oh, nonsense. Now that's liable to happen to anybody. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty swell ride myself. <laughs> Oh, wait till I get up on Blue Lightning, and then you can sit in front of me. No, no, I couldn't. Blue Lightning's the devil, dear. Yeah, he may have been once, but coming down the side of that canyon at about 40 miles an hour would take the pep out of any horse. Come on, give me your hand and jump. But are you... are you sure you can handle him? Handle... Say, didn't you just see me handle him? I... Uh, I think I'd rather walk. You can't walk back from here. Come on, now, get your foot in the stirrup and jump. Well, all right, but, but don't let him go too fast. Come on, now. Uh, there. <laughs> Uh, now we'll go home at a walk, or maybe a slow canter. <laughs> Are you comfy? Mm-hmm. Oh, Dick, you're wonderful. Huh. I guess compared to some people, I am. <laughs> you know, this horse business is a cinch once you get the feel of the thing. All you need is a little confidence. But, but what happened to Chuck, Mr. Peters? That guy. <laughs> he was scared to go down the canyon. No. He's probably up at the top thinking of an alibi. What a big Western hero he turned out to be. Yeah, and he missed the rattlesnake, too. I saw the thing scooting away. Ooh, don't mention that awful snake. I get chills just thinking about it. Hey, who's there? Who did you think it was? What are you doing, waiting for an elevator to take you down? Sovereign Chuck. cat. How did you get her? I picked her off a tree. Her horse is down in the canyon somewhere. Maybe it would be a good idea if you went down there and found it and let Mrs. Collins ride paint home. Ah, oh, but I don't know where the horse is. Hey, unless you'd prefer to have me get off this horse and continue that argument we were having. You know, I was middleweight champion of the Centerville Athletic Club. Oh, oh, sure, sure. I'll get the horse, Mr. Collins. That sure was some riding down the side of that young mountain. Ah, kid stuff. And by the way, Peters, and you too, Betty. Yeah? I'm giving a little lecture at the ranch house tomorrow on why cooks, politicians, and professors should stick to their own trade. <laughs> I expect both of you to attend. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, sir. Now get going. Betty, hop on that camouflaged hobby horse, and I'll race you back to the ranch. Yes, Dickie. And what a man Collins comes through. Our local boy certainly made good in that, little fracas. In the meantime, what's happening back in Centerville? Remember, Luke and Miss Timmons are trying to get Wendy Bill to give up the property he appropriated, which is to be used for the new factory site, which means jobs in Centerville. Join us in our next program and see what happens. Until then, goodbye. The American Family Robinson, which is broadcast regularly over this station, is written by Douglas Silver and Marjorie Bartlett, directed by Martha Atwell, and produced by the National Industrial Council. <laughs>